So you like math videos. Maybe you've combed through every 3 blue 1 brown video, or you were browsing around on YouTube and you saw a cool thumbnail. You're fascinated by that video and you have to explain it to your friend. Your friend goes, wow, how did you think of that? You reply, I saw it in a video. Oh. Your friend seems slightly disappointed, but it can't be helped, because after all, there's no way you could have thought of something so wild on your own, right? Mathematics is not produced by a single stroke of genius. Behind all the beautiful results and elegant explanations lie a grueling and sometimes frustrating process of trial and error. However, this process is something anyone can learn, and it really is just as rewarding as the result itself. And what better way is there to learn about doing math than to do math? And for this, let's look at problem 2 from the 2023 Bay Area Math Olympiad. Just for fun, let's try to put ourselves in the shoes of a competitor at this competition. Imagine you got dragged by your friends to this competition. You know that it's 4 hours long and it's a proof based competition, but that's about it. You finish problem 1 without much of a hiccup, and you move on to problem 2. It goes like this. Suppose you have an integer, let's say 3208. We call the integer substrings of that number any consecutive portion of the number. So the one digit substrings of 3208 would just be each individual digit 3, 2, 0, and 8. The two digit substrings would be 3, 2, and 2, 0. 0, 8 is identical to the one digit substring 8. The three digit substrings are 3, 2, 0, and 2, 0, 8. And lastly, the only four digit substring is 3, 2, 0, 8. The problem asks, what is the greatest integer n such that no integer substring of n is a multiple of 9? First thoughts? Pause the video here if you want to think about it. Well, I'll tell you my first thoughts. What? How is there even a largest integer that satisfies this? Isn't the answer just infinity? Ah, I suddenly wish this was a fill-in-the-blank competition instead of a proof competition. Jokes aside, there isn't an immediately obvious way to approach this problem. There aren't any obvious criteria for this largest integer, so the best thing you can do is start trying numbers. First, since 0 and 9 are multiples of 9, we can't use those digits. Also, a number is a multiple of 9 if the digits sum to a multiple of 9, so it's clear that will be our primary tool for this problem. So you spend some time trying out a lot of different numbers, and maybe you find something like this. So if you put 9 of the same digit together, the number doesn't work since it's a multiple of 9. But if you put 8 of the same digit together, it works. And 8 8 is the largest 8 digit number we can make with the digits 1 through 8. So now you decide to try some 9 digit numbers. One after another, they all don't work. How about larger numbers? You try a few, and they also don't seem to work. What if you try changing the digits so the substring that was divisible by 9 isn't anymore? A different substring becomes divisible by 9 then. Seems like you've hit something. Maybe any number that's 9 digits or larger doesn't work, and the largest number that works is just 8 8. Or so you like to think. Maybe there's one really big number out there that happens to work. So let's just call it wishful thinking. But wait, wishful thinking is actually really important. Maybe it'll be completely wrong, but you have some kind of idea of what you want to prove. Hmm. But how will you prove that every single number 9 digit or larger doesn't work? Seems pretty daunting since there's an infinite number of numbers. It might be a good idea to just start with the 9 digit numbers. Maybe one idea you have is to construct a number digit by digit. Starting with one digit, the only restriction is that the digits are 1 through 8. With two digits, we need to make sure that the digits don't add up to 9. With three digits, we need to make sure the three digits don't sum up to a multiple of 9, and we need to make sure the previous two rules hold for any substrings. It's clear that this quickly spirals out of control since we need to check all the substrings. But hey, if we have to check all the 9 digit substrings of 10 digit and larger numbers, then if we show no 9 digit number works, we automatically know all numbers larger than that don't work. Well, that reduces your work by a lot. The problem is still that you don't know how to show that 9 digit numbers don't work. Hmm. Actually, instead of showing that no 9 digit number works, it might be easier to show that every 9 digit number has a substring that is divisible by 9. Oh, you have another idea. Maybe instead of constructing a number digit by digit, you could take an existing number and modify the digits. So for example, let's take 9 ones. We know it doesn't work since the number itself, the 9 digit substring, is a multiple of 9. But what if we replaced the middle digit with a different number? How would we find a substring that's a multiple of 9? 
Well, you could simply remove ones at the ends of the number until you have a substring that's a multiple of 9. If you could somehow find a formula or pattern for how to find a substring divisible by 9 no matter what digits you change, you could show that no 9-digit number works. Only changing one digit is straightforward like we just explained. However, if we replace two digits, we have to be a bit more careful. Let's say we replace the middle digit with 4. Any substring containing the 4 and 5 ones is a multiple of 9. But now let's replace the digit next to the 4 with 5. Now there isn't a substring with 4 and 1s or 5 and 1s that's a multiple of 9. In fact, the only substring that is divisible by 9 is 45. Okay, well maybe we should treat the digits we change as a block and add 1s to it until we get a substring that is divisible by 9. When would this not work? Well, if we replace too many digits and there aren't enough 1s left to make a multiple of 9, then this method would not work. For example, if we replace the middle 3 digits with 434, then the digits we replace would add up to 11, and we would need 7 ones to make a multiple of 9, but we only have 6. In this case, a substring that would work is 1143 or 3411. So with these cases you've tested, you can't seem to find a general pattern. What's going wrong? Seems like the problem is, if you change a single digit, sometimes the location of substrings that are divisible by 9 can completely change. Basically, you can't predict where the substring is, so trying to find a pattern in this doesn't seem likely. Okay, now you're really out of ideas. You look around and everybody else seems stuck too. You catch your proctor giving you a look, so you look back down at your own paper. Your mind starts drifting. Okay, not that far. Let's try to keep it somewhat on topic. Dang, this problem would be so much easier if I had a computer. C++ is better than Java. But wait, if I actually tried doing this problem with a computer, brute forcing would also probably take a while. I would probably have to keep track of some information at each step, maybe like tabulation. Oh wait, prefix sums! Okay, pause there. What if we tried something like prefix sums where we kept the partial sum after each digit? Let's take a random 9 digit number like 774726714. After the first digit, our sum would be 7. After the second digit, it would be 7 plus 7 equals 14. After the third, it would be 7 plus 7 plus 4 equals 18, and so on. Here, we can immediately tell where a substring divisible by 9 is, since the first three digits, 7, 7, and 4 add up to 18. But wait, look at the second, third, and fourth digit. They are also two 7s and a 4, which means this substring is also a multiple of 9. How would we be able to tell that from our partial sums? The problem is that the partial sums start adding from the first digit, but our substring doesn't start from the first digit. Well, since the substring starts from the second digit, we can just subtract the first digit, or the first partial sum, from the fourth partial sum. 25 minus 7 equals 18, so we know we have a substring divisible by 9 starting at the second digit and ending on the fourth. This is really exciting, since if the difference between two partial sums is a multiple of 9, or the partial sum itself is a multiple of 9, we know there is a substring divisible by 9, and we know exactly where it is. We can simplify this even further. If any two numbers have a difference that's a multiple of 9, they must be congruent mod 9. So if we take all the partial sums mod 9, we only have to check if there are two of the same remainder, or there is a remainder that is 0. Since we want to show that every 9 digit number has a substring divisible by 9, we want to show that no matter what, in these 9 numbers, there must be a 0 or 2 of the same number. Huh, that sounds like something we could use the pigeonhole principle for. The pigeonhole principle says that if you want to fit pigeons into boxes, but you have more pigeons than boxes, then at least one box has more than one pigeon. If we look at our 9 numbers, we have 9 possible remainders mod 9, 0 through 8. If we have a 0, then great, we found the substring divisible by 9, and we're done. If we don't have a 0, then the 9 numbers must be 1 through 8. But there are only 8 numbers in 1 through 8, so one of them must repeat. Then, that means we must always have a substring divisible by 9, and you solved the problem! So how did we do? Not bad, I suppose. The solution was pretty clever and also concise, but we did waste a lot of time trying things that didn't work. Would have been nice if we skipped all that and got straight to the answer, right? Well, maybe only one idea ended up being correct, but still, each idea gave us insight into the strategies and pitfalls of the problem. For example, the construction approach didn't work, but helped us narrow down the search to only 9 digit numbers. From the get go, it was obvious that it's impossible to search all numbers 9 digits and larger, and there must have been a way to simplify the problem, but it was not obvious. 
Oftentimes, a solution to a problem doesn't present itself immediately, but becomes obvious once you look past the immediate problem. That's why it's important to not let yourself become stuck on a small part of the problem. Our second approach was to try to modify the digits and find some pattern for substrings divisible by 9. We looked at some examples and tried to form an idea for a pattern, but we also repeatedly tried to poke holes in our ideas to make sure they were justified, and that's where it fell apart. It was a genuinely good idea, but it failed because the substrings could be anywhere and could change even when changing a single digit. But it was important to realize where the approach failed since it informs us how we should look for the solution. All of a sudden, it doesn't seem so ridiculous that our solution was inspired by something from computer science. Searching through each possible substring doesn't make sense since we don't know where the substring divisible by 9 starts. So naturally, we needed an algorithmic way to find the substring divisible by 9. Of course, it still took some creativity to think of the solution, but we made it much more likely by limiting our possibilities and getting a good idea of what the solution should do for us. But arguably, our boldest decision was the wishful thinking that all numbers 9 digits and larger probably didn't work. If that wishful thinking was wrong, we would have spent all our time going down the wrong path. Or would we? I would argue not. If we really did go down the wrong path, something probably would have told us we were wrong. Or maybe not. This kind of uncertainty is a real issue in mathematics research, where mathematicians aren't always sure they will produce results. But hey, taking a gamble on an idea is the exciting part of math. Hopefully, throughout this process, you've seen how clear logical reasoning plays as important of a role as spontaneous creativity. You can try crazy ideas, but you need to be able to justify them. But at the same time, if you don't try anything, you're often not going to get anywhere. But most importantly, I hope this has made you feel that discovering something in math is a little more tangible, and it's something maybe you can do.